today I want to talk about expectations. Expectations. You know, we, we expect a lot, you know. And there's a good side to expectations and there's a not so good side to expectations. But I'm going to talk about something that exceeds expectations today. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Mark 16, verses 17 to 18. It says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, in the name of Jesus, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Well, do you believe it or do you not believe it? And I know that the uh, liberal theologians would like to tell you that these verses were added to the scriptures, that they don't belong there, that they, that they weren't original. But the whole concept in these verses is throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament. And, in fact, some of the things that said here uh, actually do appear in the Gospels, but in the other Gospel letters. But regardless of that, the truth is that there's nothing in these verses in this chapter that is contrary to what God has revealed in his word, right? Regardless of what the liberal theologians might want to say. The, uh, the liberal theolo theologians are the ones who are looking for a way to discredit the word of God. They really are. There's no doubt about it. They want the word of God to be nothing but an exercise in philosophy. Are you, am I right? If you, if you know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm absolutely right. So, these verses carry weight. But, who is this referring to? Is it the apostles? Just the apostles? Jesus was, th was speaking to all those who would be proclaiming the gospel. And that includes you and me. But this section of scripture has been a source of division within the church and caused confusion about the character of God. There are those who believe that these verses are not in the original, as I said, but we'll add later. Well, I don't know about taking up serpents. That might be a little difficult. <laughs> or the drinking of poisons. I'm not about to put that to the test. But you know what? If I accidentally drink poison, I'll probably survive. Hmm? But these people who handle snakes, they're asking for it, folks. <laughs> if you're wandering through the woods and you get bitten by a rattler, in the name of Jesus, and you'll be all right. But handling them, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> But the New Testament is filled with deliverance from demons and disease. And to all those who preach that it was only the apostles who had the authority to do that, I point this out in John 17, verses 20 to 21, where Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, these apostles. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in my name through their word. Do you believe in his name through their word? That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So it's not just the apostles, and it's not just what happened then. It's happening ever since then with all those who believe, having the authority to speak in the name of Jesus. The same authority that was given to the apostles was given to all who believe. 
So divine healing did not cease with the completion of the canon of Scripture, as so many would believe and continues to be declared by Jesus. It, it is continued by Jesus to be declared that most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the words that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. That's in John 14, 12. God gave us the authority through Jesus to manifest his holy will. And you know what? Regardless of what anybody might want to tell you, God's will is that you be well. Amen. Right? He has no desire whatsoever for you to be sick or in pain or in sorrow or anything else. That's why he says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, let your request be known to me. Eh? Isn't that what he says? Yeah. And then that peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Nowhere else. In him, in him alone. So divine healing did not cease with the completion of the canon of Scripture, as many believe. So it should be evident to anybody who would read the word of God that God can use any believer to heal the sick or cast out demons or speak against, uh, speak against an oppression, right? As Jesus did, so should we do as we are conformed to the image of the Son. That's Romans 8, 29. It's God's desire that we be conformed. You know what? We are adopted in the family, therefore we should act like the adopted, right? We have been given the authority of the adopted. But the question that continues to perplex many believers is this. How can we be sure of our healing when so often it seems to be unreliable? Doesn't happen. According to some ministries, the answer is in personal expectation. Do you expect to be healed? You'll be healed. If you don't expect to be healed, you won't be healed. Yeah, isn't that the idea? Huh? It's all about expectation. Hmm. That is taught. It is. Well, how true is that? Have you ever heard an evangelist open his message with the question, have you come today expecting a miracle? The suggestion is that you will only receive one if you expect one, and that you are limiting God if you do not expect one. God is limited by your lack of expectation. Right? Since expectation carries with it a sense of accountability, can we really Can we really limit God? Can we do that? If you don't expect a miracle, can you limit him? Since expectation carries accountability, it, and it does. You know, when you say to your kid, you know, I expect the better of you. Isn't that a statement of accountability? Well, I don't think that we should do that with God personally. <laughs> and to what degree does God depend on my expectations in order to produce a miracle or to do anything else? To be sure, God has made many promises in his word. But does an expectation, as encouraged by so many churches, imply obligation on the part of God? We don't have to hold him to his word. His word is true. We don't hold him to it. What we do is we trust him for it. Do we need to be reminded that divine blessing is a matter of divine grace rather than a matter of divine obligation? 
This is not to say that God is in any way unreliable or that he doesn't keep his word. But remember that God sees things from a higher place and knows what you need better than you do. And you know, so often, thank God his answer to a prayer might be no. Thank him. Yeah. Because we, we have an idea of what's best for us, but he has a better idea of what's best for us. So God is truly sovereign, and a sovereign God will, by definition, act only in according, according to his nature. And his nature is he wants the best for us. He only wants the best for us. And that's why in John 14, verse 13, Jesus says, And whatever you ask in my name, in my name, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What's that mean? If you ask something, ask for something, and I don't care how good, how well you can pray, if you pray for something that's contrary to the will of God, it ain't going to happen. It will not happen. If it's something outside of his, nat his nature, absolutely it will not happen. You know, there are people who would like to curse their enemies. God says, ah, 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 you love your enemy, right? It's the very nature of the Lord to bless. But it is he and not we that sovereignly determines who, how, and when to bless. And just what is it that constitutes a blessing? What do you think of when you think of a blessing? Do you think of provision, protection, Prosperity, purpose, joy, wish fulfillment, that your every desire would be met. Truly, all of these can be blessings, but do we get them by expecting them? Again, do we get them by expecting them? We have hopes based on the precious promises of God, promises that are faithful and true to those who will respond to them. But how many of us think about God what God hopes concerning us. What does God expect from us? What do we expect from God? But what does he expect from us? Does he expect our works, our obedience, our devotion, our sacrifices? We can say yes to all that stuff, you know. Certainly these are the expectations that many people believe God has towards us, but in reality, Human history has shown that only a fool would expect anything but rebellion and selfishness from mankind. This is a hard, to a hard uh, message to give because I know so many people do think that we play a very large part in receiving what God has to offer. The truth is we have a small part to play in receiving what God has to offer. In reality, I believe that God does not expect of us what I think he wants is he desires of us. He desires from us. This idea that we can please God with our works can so often lead to pride of accomplishment and evil expectations of other believers. I believe also that it may be the number one reason for a minister's focus on his ministry rather than God. God does not expect anything of us but he hopes for one thing. And what is that? Our love and our trust. That's what he wants. We talk about what we expect of God, but what does he expect of us? Nothing but our love and our trust. It is the love of a humble saint that blesses God more than the grandeur of a thousand impressive ministries it is only in love of God that we truly surrender to him. 
When our focus is on Him and not ourselves and our circumstances, our needs or our works, that is when we get out of the way and give Him access to our lives. That's the part we play. It's a small part. Small. We just get out of the way. And such was the case with Dwayne Miller, a Baptist minister and a singer who woke up one morning in 1990 with a virus that attacked his vocal cords to the point that he lost his voice. For the next three years, having lost his ministry and his confidence in God, he battled depression. Why haven't you healed me, Lord? He actually tried to commit, himself, commit suicide. He was so depressed about the whole thing. Then in January of 1993, he was invited to teach a Sunday school class at his church. The class subject was prearranged from the teaching series, so he had no say in what it was that he was teaching on. But see, God already had it worked out. So let's listen to this. Camille, put it up, please. Listen to what was recorded on the morning of 19, of uh, that morning in 1993. Here we go. To say that every single person will always be because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of Scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of Scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then in verse 4 he said, And he redeems my life from the pit. Now I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had and you have had in times past pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. I'm both overwhelmed at the moment. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> sounds funny to say a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I... <laughs> he redeems my life from the pit. <laughs> and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. 
compassionate and gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in love. The Lord will not accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's mercy. Or repay us according to our iniquities. That's mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. Well, he didn't expect that because for three years he'd been hoping for a miracle and had given up on God. And, you know, I can't say why it was that he had to wait three years, but it doesn't matter. The point is that God proven himself. He's proven himself again. He does it all the time. And we, you know, we're particularly, we are in a pill-popping society and culture, and we want it now. And, yeah, I do too, no doubt about it, you know. When you're in pain in particular, you want it now because you want deliverance from it now. And we hear about people who have persevered through their pain for days and sometimes weeks before they receive their healing. And those healings have been miraculous indeed because they have been healings that could never have occurred naturally or pharmaceutically, you know. So I don't have all the answers, I don't, and nobody does, but I have one answer, and I'm going to get to that in the next section here. Because the first thing I want to point out is that when he received his healing, was when he got to the third verse where it said, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. That was when it started. If I played it again, you would hear that. It was the next verse where he says, who redeems your life down from destruction or from the pit, destruction. Um, that's, that's when whoever wrote this, figured that that's when he started to get his healing. Uh, he got it at when he said, heals all your diseases. And I think that's significant. He started the whole thing by stating that uh, Isaiah 53 verse 5, which everybody loves to quote for healing, uh, is not true and it's misleading and it's not backed up by the Bible. He's almost right about that. And I want to tell you very quickly about that. Go ahead and put the next thing up, Camille. The word stripes, by his stripes you are healed, right? The word stripes has been thought of right from the beginning as whippings and uh, you know, receiving terrible punishment. But you know, it's the first part of Isaiah 53, 5, that talks about how he was wounded for our transgressions and his ch our chastisement was upon him. That's where the punishment is. That's where the punishment is. But what's the result of the punishment is the stripes, by his stripes. He is wounded, he is hurt for us, but by his stripes we are healed. And unfortunately to me, I believe that there has been uh, a, a, a pointless elevation of suffering in the church. That the church has taught, from the Catholic Church into the Protestant churches, they've taught that suffering is a virtue. There is no virtue in suffering. That, is the, that presents a perverse God. The virtue is in obedience in spite of the suffering. And that's what happened with Jesus. He went to the cross knowing fully well what was going to happen. And he didn't do it so that he could be in pain. He did it because he knew that it was necessary in order to fulfill his commission. Right? 
He did that out of obedience. That's why he said, not my will, but yours be done. If there's any way you can take this away, Lord, please take it away. But let your will be done, not mine. Suffering was not the virtue. His obedience was the virtue, was the virtue. And that's the same with all of us. And the problem is, with that word stripes being translated the way it has been traditionally for centuries now, it promotes this idea of virtue in suffering. It is not the suffering that makes you free. It is him in you that makes you free. Because the word suffering is there's 25, 22 verse, uh, 22 appearances of that word, habura. It's actually habura. That's, that's the Hebrew word that's translated stripes. It appears in 22 places in the Old Testament. And only two were stripes. So what is Chabra from? It's from the root Chaba, which is Strong's 2266. And if we break that down into its pictograms, you have Chet, which is a gateway, which means to join together as in marriage. Bet, the house, which speaks of a dwelling place, being together like in a family. And the rech, the head, which is the first, or the head, it's the head. And what takes place in your head is your thinking, right? Thought. So what have you got? You've got a healing of the body and the soul and the spirit that's found in Christ in you, the hope of glory, because in every one of those words, it talks about togetherness, talks about union, talks about... So what's really being said in that verse is, he is wounded for your transgressions, our chastisements are upon him, and by his union with us, we are saved by his union with us. Not, we're not saved by his chastisement. We're not saved by his punishment any more than we're saved by the cross. We are not saved by the cross. We are saved by him in us. And if you want proof of that, Romans 5.10. Pull it up. Five ten. I didn't put it in there. I'm sorry, Camille. It just came to me. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. The cross reconciled. It did not save. It reconciled. What saved? Saved by his life in us. Now you can say saved by his death, but it doesn't say that. It says saved by his life. And we know that it's Christ in you which is the hope of glory. It's not the punishment that's the hope of glory. So the cross made the offer the same as the uh, chastisement the wounds made the offer. But the offer was the gift, and the gift was Christ. The gift was union, as in a marriage, as in a marriage is what it says, with a chet, the first letter in that, in that word, chabura, is chet, and it actually speaks of union as in a marriage. So it's just wonderful. The way God has put this stuff together, and unfortunately, yeah, it's close enough. It's all right for people to think that, uh, yeah, it's uh, all his suffering got us saved. No, his suffering just made the first step, the same as the cross made the first step. Until you reach out and take what was offered, and what was offered was his life in you. Until then, you had nothing except a distorted idea of a God that likes to, likes to be, have you suffer. 
So then, just to add this up, it's true that healing did not always seem to manifest and that this fact seems to speak against the belief that God, by his nature, wants everybody to be healed. This splits believers into two groups. One that puts the blame on God, using sickness to teach a lesson, for example. How many people think that? A lot of people think that God uses sickness and hardship to teach you a lesson. Right? And the other one, the other group, puts the blame on man, saying, oh, you didn't have enough faith, or you have unconfessed sin. So there's always blame. It's either God or it's man. Well, God doesn't need to be defended, but man does have a place to play, a part to play. He does. And we, we need to know what that is. Well, Dwayne's miraculous healing moved him out of the group that he had been in and shifted his focus from expectation toward the love of God. The farmer says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Psalm 103, verse 1. And just as the sun is the source of light and the moon is the reflection of that light, so God is the source of all blessing and he receives from man a reflection of those blessings in the form of love. Divine blessing is favor and its reflection is the recognition of God's grace with gratitude and love. Truly God is the author of love and love is our link with him. When the love of God is not only received but returned to God, it becomes the irresistible force that nothing can withstand. It's given out, it must be returned. In this day when the deceiver, devil, has seen to it that love is deified, it must be remembered that it is the object of your love that's important. In Mark 12, 28 to 30, it says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The Lord, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So I come here today and every day not expecting a miracle. And I don't promise a miracle. But I desire to learn a greater love for God through Christ Jesus. For all love toward humanity proceeds not from our good works, but from our love of God. I believe that this is the way that anybody will truly be a blessing to God. And rather than holding God to expectations, I believe that we should apply Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And he will direct your paths. Amen? Amen. Trust. So trust is the best way for us to receive the promises of God, whatever they might be. Speak his word as it applies to your situation to receive his promise of Rapha. That's Hebrew for healing. Interesting, that word, because Rapha is made up of Rush, Pei, Aleph. Just three letters, three pictograms. And you know what it says? It says, healing is in speaking God's mind. That's what it says. Healing is in speaking God's mind, God's head, God's thoughts.
And when you do that, God's promises are going to work against the pit. Speak it trusting in the God who said it. So it is in Psalm 103 that we sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, from the pit, from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We live in a fallen world, but we have been adopted into the kingdom of God, where there is no disease. We've been given the ability to knock down mountains. And you know what I'm talking about here, that we have been given the strength to overcome all adversity. Does it mean we don't feel them? Absolutely we feel them. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and watch them dissolve. And how long will it take? As long as it takes. But you stick with it. You continue to trust him and trust him and trust him. And don't make excuses for him or yourself. And I speak to myself as much as to everybody else. It's so easy to be caught up in symptoms. Put them aside. Recognize they're real, but they have not the power. Amen? They've got the power that we give them, and that's it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do not think about anticipation. Do not think about expectation. Think about trust. Truly, our great God is worthy beyond all human comprehension of our love and our obedience. Amen? Amen. Amen.